Preface to the 1917 edition of the Collected Plays of Oscar Wilde by Robert Ross. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Silence. Preface by Robert Ross. As to my personal attitude towards criticism, I confess in brief the following. If my works are good, and of any importance whatever for the further development of art, they will maintain their place in spite of all adverse criticism, and in spite of all hateful suspicions attached to my artistic intentions. If my works are of no account, the most gratifying success of the moment, and the most enthusiastic approval of as augurs cannot make them endure. The waste paper press can devour them, as it has devoured many others, and I will not shed a tear. And the world will move on just the same. Richard Strauss The contents of this volume require some explanation of an historical nature. It is scarcely realized by the present generation that Wilde's works, on their first appearance, with the exception of De Profundis, were met with almost general condemnation and ridicule. The plays, on their first production, were grudgingly praised because their obvious success could not be ignored, but on their subsequent publication in book form they were violently assailed. That nearly all of them have held the stage is still a a Florentine Tragedy, a Fragment, by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by Tricia G. Characters, Guido Bardi, a Florentine Prince. Read by M.B. Simone, a Merchant. Read by Simon Lawar. Bianca, his wife. Read by Ruth Golding. The action takes place at Florence in the early 16th century. The door opens, they separate guiltily, and the husband enters. My good wife, you come slowly. We're not better to run to meet your lord? Here, take my cloak. Take this pack first. Tis heavy. I have sold nothing, save a fur robe unto the cardinal's son, who hopes to wear it when his father dies, and hopes that will be soon. But who is this? Why, you have here some friend. Some kinsman, doubtless, newly returned from foreign lands, and fallen upon a house without a host to greet him. I crave your pardon, kinsman, for a house lacking a host is but an empty thing, and void of honour, a cup without its wine, a scabbard without steel to keep it straight, a flowerless garden, widow of the sun. Again I crave your pardon, my sweet cousin. This is no kinsman, and no cousin neither. No kinsman and no cousin? You amaze me. Who is it, then, who with such courtly grace deigns to accept our hospitalities? My name is Guido Bardi. What? The son of that great lord of Florence, whose dim towers, like shadows silvered by the wandering moon, I see from out my casement every night. Sir Guido Bardi, you are welcome here, twice welcome, for I trust my honest wife, most honest if uncomely to the eye, hath not with foolish chatterings wearied you, as is the want of women. Your gracious lady, whose beauty is a lamp that pales the stars and robs Diana's quiver of her beams, has welcomed me with such sweet courtesies, that if it be her pleasure, and your own, I will come often to your simple house, and when your business bids you walk abroad, I will sit here and charm her loneliness, lest she might sorrow for you overmuch. What say you, good Simone? My noble lord, you bring me such high honour that my tongue, like a slave's tongue, is tied and cannot say the word it would. Yet not to give you thanks would to be too unmannerly, so I thank you from my heart's core. It is such things as these that knit us take together when a prince so nobly born and of such fair address, forgetting unjust fortune's differences, comes to an honest burgher's honest home as a most honest friend. And yet, my lord, I fear I am too bold. Some other night we trust that you will come here as a friend. Tonight you come to buy my merchandise, is it not so? Silks, velvets, what you will. I doubt not, but I have some dainty wares will woo your fancy. True, the hour is late, but we poor merchants toil both night and day to make our scanty gains. 
The tolls are high, and every city levies its own toll, and apprentices are unskillful, and wives even lack sense and cunning, though Bianca here has brought me a rich customer tonight. Is it not so, Bianca? But I waste time. Where is my pack? Where is my pack, I say? Open it, my good wife. Unloose the cords. Kneel down upon the floor, you are better so. Nay, not that one, the other. Dispatch, dispatch. Buyers will grow impatient oftentimes. We dare not keep them waiting. Aye, tis that. Give it to me. With care. Tis most costly. Touch it with care. And now, my noble lord, nay, pardon, I have here a Luca Damask, the very web of silver, and the roses so cunningly wrought that they lack perfume merely to cheat the wanton sense. Touch it, my lord. Is it not soft as water, strong as steel? And then the roses, are they not finely woven? I think the hillsides that best love the rose at, at Bellasguardo or at Fiesole throw no such blossoms on the lap of spring, or if they do, their blossoms droop and die. Such is the fate of all the dainty things that dance in wind and water. Nature herself makes war on her own loveliness and slays her children like Medea. Nay, but my lord, look closer still. Why, in this damask here it is summer always, and no winter's tooth will ever blight these blossoms. For every ell I paid a piece of gold, red gold, and good, the fruit of careful thrift. Honest Simone, enough, I pray you, I am well content. Tomorrow I will send my servant to you, who will pay twice your price. My generous prince, I kiss your hands. And now I do remember another treasure hidden in my house which you must see. It is a robe of state, woven by Venetian, the stuff, cut velvet, the pattern, pomegranates, each separate seed wrought of a pearl, the collar all of pearls, as thick as moths in summer streets at night, and whiter than the moons that madmen see through prison bars at morning. A male ruby burns like a lighted coal within the clasp. The Holy Father has not such a stone, nor could the Indies show a brother to it. The brooch itself is of most curious art. Cellini never made a fairer thing to please the great Lorenzo. You must wear it. There is none worthier in our city here, and it will suit you well. Upon one side, a slim and horned satyr leaps in gold to catch some nymph of silver. Upon the other stands silence with a crystal in her hand no bigger than the smallest ear of corn that waves la sainte courtesane or the woman covered with jewels by oscar wilde this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org la sainte courtesane by oscar wilde first man read by m b marina read by philippa the second man read by l french honorius read by jerry dixon the scene represents the corner of a valley in the thebaid on the right hand of the stage is a cavern in front of the cavern stands a great crucifix on the left sand dunes the sky is blue like the inside of a cup of lapis lazuli the hills are of red sand here and there on the hills there are clumps of thorns who is she she makes me afraid she has a purple cloak and her hair is like threads of gold i think she must be the daughter of the emperor i have heard the boatman say that the emperor has a daughter who wears a cloak of purple she has bird's wings upon her sandals, and her tunic is the color of green corn. It is like corn in spring when she stands still. It is like young corn troubled by the shadows of hawks when she moves. The pearls on her tunic are like many moons. They are like the moons one sees in the water when the wind blows from the hills. I think she is one of the gods. I think she comes from Nubia. I am sure she is the daughter of the emperor. Her nails are stained with henna. They are like the petals of a rose. She has come here to weep for Adonis. She is one of the gods. I do not know why she has left her temple. The gods should not leave their temples. If she speaks to us, let us not answer, and she will pass by. She will not speak to us. She is the daughter of the emperor. Dwells he not here? the beautiful young hermit he who will not look on the face of woman of a truth it is here the hermit dwells why will he not look on the face of woman we do not know why do ye yourselves not look at me 
You are covered with bright stones, and you dazzle our eyes. He who looks at the sun becomes blind. You are too bright to look at. It is not wise to look at things that are very bright. Many of the priests in the temples are blind, and have slaves to lead them. Where does he dwell, the beautiful young hermit who will not look on the face of woman? Has he a house of reeds, or a house of burnt clay? Or does he lie on the hillside? Or does he make his bed in the rushes? He dwells in that cavern yonder. What a curious place to dwell in. Of all, the centaur lived there. When the hermit came, the centaur gave a shrill cry, wept and lamented, and ran away. No, it was a white unicorn who lived in the cave. When it saw the hermit coming, the unicorn knelt down and worshipped him. Many people saw it worshipping him. I have talked with people who saw it. Some say he was a hewer of wood and worked for hire, but that may not be true. What gods, then, do ye worship? Or do ye worship any gods? There are those who have no gods to worship. The philosophers who wear long beards and brown cloaks have no gods to worship. They wrangle with each other in the porticoes. The omission in text laugh at them. We worship seven gods. We may not tell their names. It is a very dangerous thing to tell the names of the gods. No one should ever tell the name of his god. Even the priests who praise the gods all day long and eat of their food with them do not call them by their right names. Where are these gods ye worship? We hide them in the folds of our tunics. We do not show them to any one. If we showed them to any one, they might leave us. Where did ye meet with them? They were given to us by an embalmer of the dead who had found them in a tomb. We served him for seven years. The dead are terrible. I am afraid of death. Death is not a god. He is only the servant of the gods. He is the only god I am afraid of. Ye have seen many of the gods. We have seen many of them. One sees them chiefly at night time. They pass one by very swiftly. Once we saw some of the gods at daybreak. They were walking across a plain. Once, as I was passing through the market-place, I heard a sophist from Cilicia say that there is only one god. He said it before many people. That cannot be true. We have ourselves seen many, though we are but common men, and of no account. When I saw them, I hid myself in a bush. They did me no harm. Tell me more about the beautiful young hermit. Talk to me about the beautiful young hermit who will not look on the face of woman. What is the story of his days? What mode of life has he? We do not understand you. What does he do, the beautiful young hermit? Does he sow or reap? Does he plant a garden or catch fish in a net? Does he weave linen on a loom? Does he set his hand to the wooden plough and walk behind the oxen? He, being a very holy man, does nothing. We are common men and of no account. We toil all day, long in the sun. Sometimes the ground is very hard. Do the birds of the air feed him? Do the jackals share their booty with him? Every evening we bring him food. We do not think that the birds of the air feed him. Why do ye feed him? What profit have ye in so doing? He is a very holy man. One of the gods whom he has offended has made him mad. We think he has offended the moon. Go, and tell him that one who has come from Alexandria desires to speak with him. We dare not tell him. This hour he is praying to his God. We pray thee to pardon us for not doing thy bidding. Are ye afraid of him? We are afraid of him. Why are ye afraid of him? We do not know. What is his name? The voice that speaks to him at night-time in the cavern calls to him by the name of Honorius. It was also by the name of Honorius that the three lepers who passed by once called to him. We think that his name is Honorius. Why did the three lepers call to him? That he might heal them. Did he heal them? No, they had committed some sin. It was for that reason they were lepers. Their hands and faces were like salt. One of them wore a mask of linen. He was a king's son. What is the voice that speaks to him at night-time in his cave? We do not know whose voice it is. We think it is the voice of his god. 
for we have seen no man enter his cavern, nor any come forth from it. Honorius? From within. Who calls Honorius? Come forth, Honorius. My chamber is sealed with cedar and odorous with myrrh. The pillars of my bed are of cedar, and the hangings are of purple. My bed is strewn with purple, and the steps are of silver. The hangings are sewn with silver pomegranates, and the steps that are of silver are strewn with saffron and with myrrh. My lovers hang garlands round the pillars of my house. At night-time they come with the flute-players and the players of the harp. They woo me with apples, and on the pavement of my courtyard they write my name in wine. From the uttermost parts of the world my lovers come to me. The kings of the earth come to me and bring me presents. When the emperor of Byzantium heard of me, he left his porphyry chamber and set sail in his galleys. His slaves bear no torches that none might know of his coming. When the king of Cyprus heard of me, he sent me ambassadors. The two kings of Libya, who are brothers, brought me gifts of amber. I took the minion of Caesar from Caesar and made him my playfellow. He came to me at night in a litter. He was pale as a narcissus, and his body was like honey. The son of the prefect slew himself in my honour, and the tetrarch of Cilicia scourged himself for my pleasure before my slaves. The king of Hierapolis, who is a priest and a robber, set carpets for me to walk on.